Today's discussion for Larry Boy and the Bad Apple on the PlayStation 2 has some deceptively deep context. There are chapters on the video if you want to skip straight to talking about the game, but you will be missing out on a mother f***ing roller coaster experience if you do skip it. VeggieTales was a big thing for me when I was a child. I was raised Methodist, and so these little CGI salad toppings were a mainstay in my household. I owned so many of the VHS tapes. Jesus, that makes me sound old. I especially liked the Larry Boy episodes, superhero-themed parodies, primarily spoofing Tim Burton's Batman films, though the pertinent entry for today switches over a bit more towards the Raimi Spider-Man films. Larry the Cucumber would take on the persona of Larry Boy, with a distinctive purple cowl, vaguely shaped like a Spartan helmet, except for the inclusion of his iconic super suction ears, which were used like Batman's grappling hook. In hindsight, I only recently realized the whole thing makes a subtle cross shape, which is appropriate considering Larry will someday kill God to take his place dominating the cosmos. Also helping in his war on crime is his butler, Alfred. Eat shit, Warner Bros. You can't copyright the name Alfred. You are powerless before VeggieTales. Recently, I was watching a whole bunch of VeggieTales so I could make... Well... Well, hello, milady. You look like you could use a good... Oh, my! That. Video linked in the description. Maybe even a card up top if I'm feeling wild when I upload this. What really stood out to me was... 1. The terrifying implications of sentient fruits and vegetables using fruit pies as weapons during wartime. Imagine if the army launched human flesh at the enemy after specifically baking it into a pastry. Anyway, 2. These episodes still hold up surprisingly well. The jokes are frequently clever and got at least a chuckle out of me. The music always showcases tons of talent. Even the older animation still holds up decently well, since Big Idea was smart enough to make characters far too cartoony to enter the Uncanny Valley back then. And I could even see how slightly later episodes, still from my childhood, showed improvements in both animation skill and budget. Comparing the relative simplicity from Larry Boy's first episode, The Fib from Outer Space, to the surprisingly complex second episode, Larry Boy and the Rumor Weed, from a couple of years later, was rather eye-opening. I didn't exactly pick up on subtler animation nuances back when I was four, for some reason. The messages presented occasionally hold up less now, though most of them are relatively harmless compared to a lot of evangelical messaging, and some of them absolutely have some applicability even for the non-religious. Sure. Lying can escalate pretty monumentally. That is true. Also, the anti-selfishness episode, King George and the Ducky, is actually a great deconstruction of both monarchism and our modern capitalistic hellscape, if you push the threads to their logical extent. A. By giving absolute authority to a single figure, the other characters are coerced into performing unethical actions against their own conscience, which only serves to benefit the authority figure. And B. George's ever-growing greed leads to accumulating more duckies than he can possibly use, yet he takes further advantage of the poor by claiming their ducks for himself. He literally profits by sending a poor boy to war. Once he is made aware of the deep depravity of his actions, he remorsefully changes his ways, and Bob the Tomato explicitly states he redistributes his wealth of duckies for the good of the people, so no one has a lack of duckies. Hear that, conservatives? He redistributed his wealth for everyone to benefit. VeggieTales went full leftist woke in the year 2000. What you gonna do about it, you fucking cowards? This actually isn't even my main microphone at, at the moment. I'm wearing a, a lavalier mic for, for this part of the video. Getting back to the point that some of the messages aren't this absolutely based, my only hang-ups really aren't veggie tales per se, and just issues inherent to Christian meta-narratives. One episode had a single line that sent me 
spiraling down a rabbit hole of the worst possible implications, one which probably seems pretty innocuous if you're not familiar with how the church works. This is going to require a trigger warning for brief discussion of sexual assault. Christianity has forced me to place a trigger warning for sexual assault in a video about veggie tales. Fucking Christ. Time code on the screen to skip the gnarly bit, as well as a warning sign in the top corner so you can be visually sure you're past it. In the rumor weed, the titular rumor weed is spreading rumors, and the message is to not spread rumors. I'm going to post Daddy Asparagus's full spiel so you also have full context, but I tweaked the video to avoid triggering a copyright claim. Corporations will always disregard fair use because they know normal people cannot afford lawyers to fight them on it, and they're more likely to detect a long clip. I've linked to the full episode, which they posted here on YouTube, so you know I've not otherwise altered the message. If you hear something about someone that sounds bad, or even just weird, you should ask them about it, or ask your mom or dad. But don't spread rumors. Even if it's true, God doesn't want us to tell stories that can hurt. He wants us to spread nice words. The problem line is, even if it's true. The resulting message is subtly changed from don't spread rumors to don't tell things that could harm someone's reputation, even if it's true. Go straight to your parents or the person directly. The problem is when this person directly is church leadership. Big idea almost certainly meant nothing by that line, but good intentions can't separate from the reality that the church habitually covers up sex crimes committed by its leaders. The church almost always opts to handle things internally instead of going to external authorities. For some reason, internal review overwhelmingly leads to the conclusion that the harm to the church leader's reputation is worse than the harm to the victim, assuming the internal review even believes the victim in the first place. There are cases where the victims have been coerced into publicly forgiving the sexual predator in front of the congregation instead of being able to seek justice. I could talk in depth about how the Christian messages mandating forgiveness are commonly used to manipulate and exploit the parishioners, but that would be even further off topic. Regardless of Big Idea's intention with this lesson, if a child were to follow the explicit instructions this episode puts forward, they are much more likely to be giving power to an abuser. The episode relevant to this video also has a considerably less heavy problem. The point of Larry Boy and the Bad Apple is that, to avoid loosely defined temptation, which going off of the context shown in the episode would be more usefully expressed as addictive or compulsive behaviors that are interfering with your quality of life, you should seek support from loved ones. And God. It's the Alcoholics Anonymous method, and unfortunately, it wraps up a helpful suggestion with a drawback. You are much more likely to recover from addiction with the support of someone you can trust. That part is good. However, addiction is rarely a clean getaway. The unfortunate reality is that relapse is a probable event during the process. Christ fans believe that God will never put temptations that they cannot overcome in front of them, clearly having never heard of heroin. With that in mind, if someone believes that success lies between them and an infinitely powerful being who cannot make mistakes, when relapse happens, it becomes an extra burden on the person. Since God can't fail them, they failed God. Psychological vulnerability helps the church at the expense of the vulnerable individual, since it feeds into the manufactured narrative that only the church can help, you weak little punk-ass mortal. Call me a radical leftist, but I think preying on vulnerable individuals is a dick move. With this kind of recurring baggage, it's clear that Veggie Tales will be unable to do the job of converting me over. Now, in the churches. Not defense, but I'm also not going on the offensive either. In the church's fence, conversion strategies are far more commonly about making emotional connections and emotional appeals instead of intellectual ones. This is not me throwing shade, 
That is something apologists will commonly state. I think that I would tell them that they need to understand the proper relationship between faith and reason. And my view here is that the way in which I know Christianity is true is first and foremost on the basis of the witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart. And that this gives me a self-authenticating means of knowing that Christianity is true wholly apart from the evidence. So, maybe I just need to give VeggieTales an extra emotional hook. You know what I'm emotionally invested in? Los Videojuegos. VeggieTales only published one video game title, a tie-in to Larry Boy and the Bad Apple, on the PlayStation 2 and Game Boy Advance. I'll pocket the Game Boy version and just focus on the main console version today. So, we get to the main premise. Can Larry Boy on the PS2 save my eternal soul? I got to the point very fast, don't look at the time code. Don't do it. Before I played, I watched the episode in question to make sure I wasn't missing any context, since I do like me some context. Stop looking at the time code. I hadn't watched this one as a child, because it came out after I had largely outgrown VeggieTales. In 2006. Jesus, that makes me sound old. I'll just give you the most crucial takeaways. Most of the animation is much more advanced than his previous adventures, though the new Larry Boy model is actually a step back in a couple of ways from his old one. The costume looks more artificially layered and loses some of the roundness around the edges, and the purple previously had a nice sheen that helped the material look distinct, but now it's a flatter matte purple that is just less visually appealing. He does at least get more motion. He distinctly uses his super suction ears for Spider-Man styled swinging now, something they definitely could not have pulled off prior. Larry Boy is also more capable. In the original episodes, the joke is that he is ineffective against the villains, and never actually saves the day. He actually saves the day here. The new villain is... A temptress apple with artificial spider legs who spins reality warping webs. Loki, they definitely coated this apple with more sex appeal than I expected from produce. I fear that someone, somewhere, has jerked it and or jilled it to this apple. Bless your heart, you are the busy one. Don't you ever relax? Well, yeah. Maybe I could come in and give you a demonstration? Yes, I'm watching this and I'm slowly getting horned up. She also has a worm sidekick, which probably seems a bit odd, but they did establish sentient worms all the way back in the Jonah movie, as the caterpillar in that is explicitly half-worm. I said, as though that was a normal sentence. Surprisingly, her story fleshes out the lore of the city of Bumbleburg more than I was expecting. Larry Boy's temptation is chocolate, which, amongst other issues, gives him the shits. Something I did not want to know. Her other main targets are the mayor, Madame Blueberry, who is tempted by... dresses. So she can be pretty. That feels kinda sexist, but in a generic way. And the news anchor Petunia, who has a crippling gaming addiction. Which is a touch ironic, considering this is the only game VeggieTales published on consoles. When they arrest the worm henchman, there's a gag about how the worm is visibly not resisting arrest, but they slap resisting arrest as a charge on him, because they just can. Officer! Arrest this worm! What's the charge? Accomplice to temptation with intent to lead astray, operating a giant Macintosh without a permit! What? You can't arrest me! And resisting arrest! It's funny, you know, that real-world thing that real-world cops do to real-world civilians in a total display of real-world authoritarian abuse of power. What a... What a silly joke. Finally, this line. Alright, everyone! Squid! My first reaction while playing was a surprising little burst of childlike giddiness. I was controlling Larry Boy. Kid Me would have been all about that shit. This is unambiguously a 3D puzzle platformer, first and foremost in the broader vein of games like Spyro the Dragon, Lego Star Wars, or any of the trillions of 3D platformers that swarmed to the PS2 like it was fertile breeding ground. 
Larry Boy's most iconic tools are his Larry Mobile and his Super Suction Ears. So here, most of his gameplay is based around... A gliding cape. Something he did not use in the episode at all. There is technically precedence for a caped Larry Boy, as he had one in the 2D animated episodes, though I'm not aware of it having any built-in utility, as his gadgets just always popped out of his belt with a big mechanical arm there. Even if I am wrong, that show is in its own continuity anyway, as his butler just goes by Archibald, the asparagus character's real name, there. Perhaps they did fear Warner Bros. power over the name, Alfred. I know I jokingly made the following comparison in my Arkham Asylum video, but I actually mean it here. The gliding does actually resemble the gliding in LEGO Batman, except this game precedes LEGO Batman by a couple of years. The cape gets other abilities throughout, too. It starts off being able to transmute Larry into solid metal. There's no precedence I know for that one. It's only used for pushing buttons, which you'd think they could have done without transforming. Like, they could have just allowed normal Larry to step on a button and then it activates. There's a later transmutation, where the cape turns him into a being of pure energy. It only identifies it as electricity, and is just used to charge up random devices. But look at this motherfucker. That's Firestorm. He just accessed the power of the atom. Imagine if Dr. Manhattan exclusively used his abilities to turn on your toaster. Outside of cape stuff, Larry's basic attack is spinning, since he doesn't have fists. And, in an actually clever idea, it discourages button mashing since he gets dizzy if you do it too much at once. No one above the age of three is likely to do it too much in combat due to the simplicity of combat, but I still like the touch. He also starts out with a first-person super soaker for various wet purposes, which sadly elicits no response out of Alfred when I squirt all over him. You do eventually get to use the super suction ears for some situational grappling, activating buttons, or slingshotting yourself, but it's highly rudimentary and has a truly pathetic range. If this game had Spider-Man 2 swinging, it would have been game of the century. There were underutilized buttons on the controller. They could have done it. The very simple combat suffices, but they could have done so much more with it. One enemy type is beaten with spinning, another is immune to that, so they have to get sucked off, and another has mounted cannons, which you defeat by deflecting their temptation spheres back at them, again by spinning. I personally think they should have assigned different combat strategies to different cape forms, so that they could be used for more than just bare-bones environmental puzzles. As mentioned though, the platforming is the basis. Larry Boy can jump or double jump before gliding, with occasional places where upward drafts can extend his glide. You are encouraged to explore by the 200 music notes hidden in each level, mostly found by smashing into things, with bigger music sheets being hidden slightly more in depth. Collectibles unlock things like videos and minigames. Using music notes is just a bit random. VeggieTales were almost always musicals, so it's not completely out of the blue, but they could have come up with something a little more appropriate. I'm currently picturing Jesus bobbleheads that increase your bartering by 10 skill points, but that's certainly just a me thing. Actually finding the musical notes is not very enthralling. You'll mostly get them from smashing the environment, except it's inconsistent whether two identical objects will drop them or not. So I'd always get about 80% there at the end of a level, and it wasn't worth going back for the rest. Honestly, the main gameplay loop of platforming is spotty. 3D platforming, generally speaking, across the medium often makes it hard to judge exactly where you're landing if it's not fine-tuned enough, and it's definitely not fine-tuned enough here. Fittingly, the controls are best described as, it feels like trying to pilot a cucumber, though in the most unintentional way possible. Making the problem worse is that game performance is not great. Especially detail-intensive levels, like Petunia's video game addiction, really make things start to chug. One series of corridors where you have to jump over numerous raising tower platforms combined the control problems with the performance problems. There were so many moving components with so many patrolling enemies and lasers down below on top of the complex environmental effects that it rapidly kneecapped performance and things developed into frustration. I mostly died because of factors beyond my control and was not helped by lack of a good checkpoint, leading me to redundantly redo several easier rooms before I could even get to the part likely to kill me again. Even when the game is running properly though, I quickly realized how sluggish everything is. All of Larry Boy's gadgets take a moment to register before they activate. 
movement speed feels way too slow when you need to cross a longer distance, such as the main hub, and even something as simple as fall speed is too slow. There is already gliding for controlled descents, so falling doesn't need to be so slow. I found myself having to wait for Larry Boy to finish falling. It's hard to get a feeling across without handing you a controller, but trust me, those extra split seconds feel off while playing. Despite that, he still takes fall damage, wherein he turns into this disturbing flat version of himself. Despite the unusual life forms present, VeggieTales rarely gets that cartoony with the physics. They usually respect a fairly realistic degree a normal person would match, so this feels extraordinarily out of place. Like, if a Spider-Man game did this, it's about that degree of whiplash. Visually, the game is purely sufficient. The graphics were most commonly just there, eliciting no emotional response. Though to shit on Petunia's level again, I did think a few places were starting to get a bit garish. It wasn't quite ugly, but it was certainly closer than the rest of the game. Sound design fared better, in the sense that it was still sufficient, but occasionally rose up about a notch higher. Music is mostly pleasant enough. It is usually very short bits that loop too often, but even then, it's not too grating. I technically really dislike the twangy country music that goes along with a level involving some mine shafts, but I have some very bad experiences connected to country music, so that's probably just me again. If you're a music buff and you know Veggie Tales, you will recognize some of the tunes, but I am not a music buff and only spotted one. The voice acting was also done by the original cast members, and credit where it is due, the cast of the show famously always does a great job bringing life to their respective produce. The little in-between bits of banter between Alfred and Larry Boy were usually silly and insignificant, but they felt like the kind of things I could see the characters saying in a normal episode. Inexplicable rhyming, but dialing Larry Boy while ordering a pizza? That's VeggieTales for ya. Unfortunately, even this part of the experience pissed its jorts just a little bit. Larry Boy frequently repeats the same few lines every time he uses an ability, and worse still, the same one line Look out below! when you have the audacity to fall distances greater than, I don't know, four millimeters. Alfred also tends to keep tutorializing long after you need him to. I'd sometimes finish a task and he was still going for a bit after. Come on game, you just cut the dialogue short when that happens. Story time. We start with truncated versions of some of the episode scenes giving only a brief tutorial in the Larry Cave, where Alfred conveniently just knows the solution to the webs, is squirting them with the sports drink. So it's a much earlier discovery here than the late episode reveal. It then throws things straight into Larry Boy's Chocolate Wonderland Temptation level. I was immediately concerned this game would simply dump me into three to four disconnected levels before passing out in the bed like a two-pump chump, but thankfully, my fears were unfounded in this one very specific instance. Larry Boy and the Bad Apple does clear the bar set by Ninja Bread Man, for whatever that's worth. In the episode, the Apple only has the Worm Henchman, but she also has troops here. Apparently, vegetable on vegetable violence would just be too much, but they went with an option that created the weirdest implications. Since she has robotic spider legs, I myself would have just given her robotic spider goons. Here though, she commands disembodied spirits. The ones you can attack are possessing clothing as a makeshift body, and the others are outright intangible, as I've established. So, the villain's main theme is temptation. She rules otherworldly realms she wants to trap you in forever. Her main goal is to get everyone trapped in one so bad, the episode itself won't even let us see what is happening inside. So. I can't help but suspect some sort of Hellraiser-esque torture pleasures. Her main help is only a degree removed from being a talking serpent, and the rest of her muscle is an army of evil spirits. Guys, she is Satan. Larry Boy fucking fought Satan incarnate, and they thought I wouldn't notice. To escape his temptation, Larry Boy has to complete a number puzzle. She, Satan, yells a string of numbers at you, and if you're not on the right cookie, it drops you to your death. Not only was I confused the first couple of times, 
I don't really know how this works within the whole thematic allegory for escaping temptation. Do they do this in AA meetings? That sounds fun. Maybe I should become an alcoholic. Turns out I was confused because it was less of a puzzle than it first appeared to be. The first number she yells is just the number you go to, and then she's just counting to that number for your countdown. So if she yells, four, one, two, three, four, you have to go to four and you have a count till four before the other cookies disappear. Once you escape, you can technically explore Bumbleburg, but there's very little to do, and most of that very little requires later abilities. So I'd recommend to just keep moving through levels for now. For level two, you go to save Mayor Blueberry. Again, the plot says she's tempted by wanting to be pretty, but the level design seems to be going for something else entirely. And honestly, the interpretation here gets much more interesting and a bit more worrying. So these webs create realms specifically designed per each individual. We've seen this already. So if being pretty were really her main temptation, I'd imagine the level would be some sort of upscale boutique with the demon ghost enemies in fancy dresses with luscious lips. The episode, and likewise the relevant cutscene, only show one room, sort of a mansion, but with racks of nice clothing, so still in the realm of expectations. Feels like she's attending a fancy ball. The level is not this, though. Sure, it's still a very expensive manner, but it's a dramatically different environment. Whether it means to or not, there's environmental storytelling going on here. This is a manner of old money. The style of the place, busts of presumable progenitors, old organs, and record players, fancy golden goblets, it all screams long-established generational wealth. By the way, you turn on the record player and it sucks in some demons? I don't think the developers know how record players work. Throughout the level, we see how this family established their wealth. They're suited above mine shafts filled with huge gems. This is buy and ruin Twitter levels of wealth Mayor Blueberry is being tempted by. There's a painting on one wall specifically of Larry's mansion. She is clearly deeply envious of the mega rich. This would be, eh, whatever, most people would like more money, I would like more money, but she is the head political figure in Bumbleburg. This is a woman who could easily be lured in by a big enough offer from a political lobbyist. What happens when Mr. Nezzer decides chocolate bunny worship needs to have more sway over politics? Bumbleberg is one paycheck away from Choco Fascism with her in charge. What happens when slushy manufacturers decide a war against Jericho will net them a nice profit? They start by turning to... Wait, can you imagine a combatant dropping a sludge artificially flavored like human meat on you? That's also fucked up. What was I talking about again? Larry Boy intercepts the Bad Apple, currently tempting Mayor Blueberry, with fashion that reminds me a lot of the Antebellum South, much to my discomfort. Clearly she has no interest in paying any workers for digging those emeralds out of that mine. This boss fight, if you can even call it that, is pretty slow and tedious. Devilette reflects heat beams around the room with the fashion mirrors, but the beams don't even damage you. You have to consciously hop onto a platform that is glowing red to take any damage. When the mirror gets hot enough, you have to navigate over to the nearest platform to destroy it with your squirt gun. But if you accidentally fall off somewhere, you have to hop over to the far edge of the room, wait for an elevator platform, and then start this step over as the mirror has now cooled back down. There are four mirrors, and there's an obnoxious wait between breaking them as the bad apple has an angry animation, and a delay of several seconds before she'll even start up the next phase. Once you eventually finish this, Larry Boy slut shames Blueberry for God. You can't be the mayor God wants you to be if all you ever think about is how you look. He never addresses her obvious greed for billions of dollars, because obviously it's much worse for women to want to look nice. Next is Petunia's level. Instead of Tron-style racing, which could have been either a cool change of pace or horrible vehicular controls, probably the latter after the current track record, it's more of the same stuff. You activate a bunch of mainframes or some other techno excuse to pad out the level. I'm curious, though. If my name was Control Switch, would you call me Master Control Switch? 
Well, <laughs> Master Larry, why do you ask? Just checking. Okay, I know butlers are sort of expected to do the whole master thing. But did that just feel a touch domination-y to anyone else? I feel like Larry is low-key doming Alfred on the side now. There's a brief segment where it switches to simulated 2D side-scrolling, which is kind of cool, I guess. Though being so zoomed out makes the gameplay feel even slower, and the boulder bit at the end is a little finicky while you figure out the timing. The next boss fight is actually less of a fight than even the last one. Here, you hit a button, which slowly turns to the right. So you hop up there, fight a single guy, and hit the button again. Then, it goes all the way around to the left, so you hop back down, then up on the left, where you fight a single guy, and hit the button a third time. Petunia's platform raises, you fight a single deflection enemy, and grapple up to the next set of identical platforms where the identical process happens again. This happens four times. I was tempted to just repeat the instructions four times to make the point, but even that seemed too tedious. I never thought playing video games could get me into so much trouble. It only becomes trouble when you choose to play games instead of taking care of more important things. I feel like you're getting a little personal there, bub. We finished with the characters tempted during the episode, but the game has extra content in store for us. Paul Grape is the fire marshal here, and he gets tempted by toy collecting. Games? Toys? Looking fucking gorgeous? Jesus. H, they are coming after me hard. The level is appropriately toyetic. The primary bit is a castle, but there's also a rocket ship, an RC dragon, a train set, toy cars, and very delightfully dinosaur-shaped sponges. We even get a quick glance at a Larry Boy plushie. Sadly, I cannot determine if it is the real-world reversible LaRussi toy. Even if we assume everything represented are items Paul Grape is tempted to collect, he is a bit of an odd collector. Chess pieces seem like a classy thing to collect, but alphabet blocks you'd give to a toddler? That's a bit creepy, pa. There was one bit, had the game performance been better, that would have stood out as a cool moment. One room sets up a puzzle of pulling various levers to open various doors. But when you pull the central lever to start, a door on each side opens up, for turret enemies to ambush you all at once. It felt more clever than most enemy encounters. A different moment stood out because the spotty platforming and unresponsive controls during poor performance made it harder than it should have been. You're just supposed to jump across some rocks being lifted by lava and get to the other side. However, the shape of the rocks sends you unintentionally sliding off if you land too close to the edge of the platform. This stupid ass setup took me so long. At one point, just falling into the previous area down below, because of course, they placed it precariously above things. Strangely, the lava lifting the rocks does not damage you upon touching it, though considering how many times I face planted into it, I suppose I should not complain. This boss fight remembers to fight back. Though it is still too slow, as you still have to do it in four parts, and it does rely on wading through the speed of the water gun, as well as the random pauses in between anything happening, which have been rampant throughout this game, it is more active, which alleviates some of the pain of the others. Bielza bobbing for apples directly challenges you. If you can stop her train, she'll let the fire marshal go. She calls in a tactical airstrike against you, and then you try to dump water on the train's coals. You have to get the timing right. Too soon, and you miss, but too late, and the smoke comes up through the metal grate you're standing on and damages you. It's honestly not a bad premise, which, by default, makes it the best boss fight yet. Not that that's saying much. Mr. Lunt, the series' 1940s gangster vegetable, not making that up, it's real, is the baker baking the town's anniversary cake, but gets tempted by, quote, Episode 9 of a Star Wars-esque movie, Proving this to be a work of fiction, as Episode 9 is definitely not tempting anyone in real life. 
somehow Palpatine returned. Naturally, this means we have a sci-fi spaceship level, and unfortunately, this means the level's complexity gave me a few moments of the worst performance I experienced in the game. Fortunately, these moments did not kill me. The uncertain platforming killed me, but it was not the performance this time. There were legitimate moments where it was really cool, if too much for this game to handle. Look at all this elaborate shit. Any other game, I'd be wowed. And instead, I was just holding my breath that the controls wouldn't stop responding to me halfway across. Then you get to slingshot Larry Boy to glide through floating debris, and it just made me sad the whole game's design wasn't at this caliber. This is a legitimately fun moment. And then, our next boss experience brings me back to Earth. Juicy Lucifer just has a bunch of lasers you have to deactivate by spraying targets to raise shields, like the world's slowest carnival game. But naturally, it does things to make even that slower. Every once in a while, creepy-ass robot eyeballs open up, meaning you have to throw up a force field before a laser death trap takes its merry fucking time death trapping around you. If you finished with your current shield, and the eye doesn't open, do not make the mistake of trying to cross. The in-between platforms disappear the exact second it decides it's actually going to do this step. And then you get to start the whole process over. Also, do not make the mistake of trying to push the final shield the last quarter inch it needs to go to win if that eye opens. No matter how close it looks, the shield will not move fast enough. I was especially kicking myself for that death, since that meant I literally just wasted the efforts worth 99% of the encounter for nothing. Naturally, this is like all of the earlier boss fights and happens in four stages. Hey, game. Normal games max their boss fights with three stages. Stop doing these in four stages! Finally, the developers either ran out of budget for more levels or more main series characters to get tempted. While this means we don't get to help Junior Asparagus overcome his crippling porn addiction, we do at least get to move on to the final boss. The Bad Apple has set up a large, inflatable structure to tempt anyone who goes inside forever. Appley's Fun House 2. It's a complete non-sequitur in the game, because they cut out all of the lore scenes. The, the first one was back in the 1700s. I tried to go inside, and unsurprisingly, it would not let me. This is the most passive final boss I have ever seen. She just sits on top, with some webs from her feet anchored around the town square, and waits for you to come attack her. Thrilling. For once, it doesn't happen in four stages. It happens in six. Fuck. How it works is you go over to a web, defeat any enemies guarding it, and squirt it away. Her arm snaps back and stuns her, and then you just go squirt her in the face while she's stunned. Technically, she can come to and recast that web, but it takes a very long time. And I only know this because this fight is so monotonous and trudging that I once completely forgot to do the last part and squirt her in the haze the game trapped me in. Alfred and Larry Boy have dialogue to outright explain the mechanics of the encounter, as they have been doing for most of these, but they actually get it wrong. Larry Boy says he'll have to slingshot himself over to the Bad Apple, but that's not true. You just glide over to her from the nearest building, it requires no slingshot. There was one... novel strategy the game employed against me. It forgot to spawn in some enemies until I was already standing in the location where they were supposed to be. This occurred during the cutscene where her legs do go all the way up, so all I could do was hear Larry Boy taking damage in the background, waiting to be able to take control again. It cut back just in time to witness his untimely death. Neat. This fight brought tedium to a whole new level. Most of the webs are anchored on various rooftops, so you have to use combinations of gliding in gadgets to get there. The problem is, there's only one place to access any of these rooftops, over near the upper left, so you just have to keep returning there again, and again, and again, 
And again, each time you give her the money shot, it also teleports you right back to the center of the square again. So you can't even use the height from the top of Appley's Funhouse 2 for a head start. This fight never changes. She never starts using free legs to fight back. It just drags on and forces you to repeat every step of the process, every time, while the final boss sits there, doing nothing. When you finally complete this, it cuts over to the far more energetic scene of victory and closure from the episode, and now you have freedom to go back to the earlier levels for completion. No thank you. Or you can complete the two side activities in the Bumbleberg hub. There are gliding challenges, which give you three minutes to go through a bunch of checkpoints without landing on the street. These suck because every control problem present in the platforming will make you fail, and you have to do so much navigation from the one access point to even get to the starting points that these are tedious before you've even started. I didn't have it in me to complete a single one of these. The other activity is finding all the town children hiding from you. Gee. Wonder why they're hiding from a man who squirts on them in an alleyway. There are also some mini-games accessible from the main menu. The memory matching game is too slow to be fun, since you have to use the super suction ears to manually select each one, but the other two are more interesting. There's a darts game, where you slingshot Larry Boy at different character tokens worth different point totals, which seem to have enough strategy to appeal to someone intrigued by the concept, or, alternately, Anyone with the desire to launch Larry Boy into the void of space after the frustrations of the main game. There's also Tic-Tac-Toe, which I mistakenly assumed would be boring. Instead, you're gliding vast distances, dodging lasers and marking spots by landing on them. And this is badass. I would dig seeing something like this in some sort of Mario Party styled game, unironically. There's technically some bonus stuff you can unlock too. There's concept art, which is mostly really crappy. I don't think they hired a concept artist. You can also listen to classic VeggieTales songs, but instead of getting video clips, it's just over sweeping shots of the Larry Cave, which loses a lot of the fun. So, did Larry Boy and the Bad Apple for PS2 save my eternal soul? I feel like directly answering that question would really be an insult to your intelligence at this point. Good news, this game is evidence for a god. Bad news, it's not a loving god. Look, there were moments I had gleaned entertainment. Occasionally, the environmental objects proved to be very delightful, like the candy canes which just went flying, and this game obviously gave me a lot of stuff to talk about. In some ways, the presentation of the content here honestly felt better than the episode itself, which felt pretty mid-tier for a VeggieTales episode. Lower mid-tier if I'm being as accurate as I can. Delving deeply into the alternate temptation realities was a cooler concept than the way the episode rapidly glossed over them. So, for me, as a weirdo, it was at least worth my time in the strangest sense of the phrase. For anyone who isn't Bane Shakes Charlie, though, eh, the game is pretty rough. It's definitely one of the worst games I've played. I keep contemplating a hypothetical situation where, for some reason, I would have to choose between replaying this or Altair's Chronicles, a Nintendo DS spin-off Assassin's Creed game, which I absolutely loathe, and I can't actually provide a definitive answer to that. I'd even say that this game is bad enough to create theological problems. Faith in Jesus is supposed to give great abilities. Faith like a mustard seed can move mountains and all that shit. I'm assuming, in Big Idea's favor, that they have plenty of faith when they're making Veggie Tales. So why didn't God's omnipotence translate into a better game? I definitely think Larry Boy and the Bad Apple is considerably more likely to give a young gamer a negative impression of Christianity than a positive one, just from the emotional takeaway of playing this garbage. 
I'm not going to delve into that further because that just gets into the biblical plot hole of a supposedly all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful god coming into conflict with the direct and observable counter-evidence provided by reality, and honestly, that argument still resonates more strongly by using the Holocaust as your example instead. If you've stuck around this long on this video, I want to personally thank you. Your support means quite a lot to me. If you're willing to leave a like and a comment, that helps even further. I will be coming back to the Game Boy Advance version at some point, though I've got a few other projects lined up first, since not everyone is looking for an endless Larry Boy stream.